hyperkalemia. Normal serum potassium is about 3.5 to 5 milli equilibrium per liter. The increase of serum potassium changes will happen in the ECG as following. The first change in the ECG will be narrowing and peaking of the T wave. So this is the normal complex and then it will start by being and narrowing of the T wave or tinting of the T wave. Then the second change will be prolongation of the BR interval and then with further stretch of the BR interval the B wave will diminute in its amplitude and then will disappear. And then the QRS complex will be stretched again and again and then the sine wave will be produced to produce this shape at last in severe hyperkalemia. So it is exactly like somebody benched the T wave at start and then pulling the ECG from this side. It will start by prolongation of the BR interval, then diminution of the B wave and then eventually it will disappear and then widening of the QRS complex. This ECG from one of my patients, I saw him many years ago in the hemodialysis unit. His potassium level was 9.7 milli equilibrium per liter and unfortunately this patient died 30 minutes later. This is a very wide complex as we can see here without any B wave, we can't see any B wave here which we'll call it sine wave appearance, severe hyperkalemia. Of course this is an emergency. This is an ECG of hyperkalemia case. We can see this patient has white QRS complex. This is one of the differential diagnosis of white QRS complex, not only conduction disturbance. Here is also it's a conduction disturbance, but because of metabolic reasons, not bundle branch block. And we will see later the differential diagnosis of the white QRS complex. And here B wave is a little bit diminuted. And here the rhythm is regular, but there is white QRS complex. That's why we should suspect in metabolic delay. Another case. In this ECG, we will find some ST segment elevation lead 1. Lead 2 has very clear ST segment elevation. Lead 3 a little bit elevation. And then AVF also. And from V2, V3, V4, V5, and V6. So there is widespread ST segment elevation, which is a little bit concave upwards, as we can see in this lead. And also, if we notice the baseline of the ECG, as we said before, it should be determined from the line before the B wave, not after the B wave. Here, the BR segment is a little bit depressed. And in AVR, the BR segment is a little bit elevated. So in this ECG, we can find diffuse ST segment elevation, which is not respecting any grouping of the lead. It is not inferior, not lateral, not anterior. It's widespread ST segment elevation, which is going upwards and associated with BR segment depression. This is an ECG of a case of pericarditis. Pericarditis. This condition resembles ST elevation MI in chest pain and ST segment raising. But ST segment raising in pericarditis has certain features. The shape, usually it's concave upwards. The site involves any lead, so it doesn't respect any lead grouping, as in MI, associated with the breast BR segment. On the serial ECG, and this is a very important differential point between both entities is ST segment will return to the isoelectric line first then the T wave will start to be inverted in ST elevation MI the reverse is happening so T wave inverts before the ST segment returns to the baseline as we said before T waves don't appear even with persistent chest pain this is also a differentiation point between both entities here the ST segment is concave upwards then the ST segment will return back to the baseline, then the T wave will start to be inverted. But in ST elevation MI, before the ST segment returns to the baseline, the T wave will invert in a stage called evolving stage, and we can find some cues here in cases of ST elevation MI. Clinically, chest pain and pericarditis 
is not related to effort, not relieved by rest or nitrates or even thrombolytics. It will decrease with leaning forward and may be associated with pericardial rub on auscultation and also the nature of the pain itself. In pericarditis, the chest pain is of the pleuritic type because it's a serous membrane inflammation. It is not the visceral type of pain like what is happening in MI in angina. This is also a case of classic pericarditis. You will find concave upward ST segment elevation, which is widespread, and also BR segment depression lead one and lead two, and BR segment elevation, a little bit elevation of the BR segment in the AVR with widespread ST segment elevation in all leads. Pericarditis. In this ECG, we will find here a little bit right axis deviation with S wave prominent S wave in lead 1 which shouldn't be there lead 2 is unremarkable and then lead 3 is showing prominent Q wave and the inverted T wave so we'll have S in lead 1 Q in lead 3 inverted T in lead 3 S1 Q3 T3 and also there is some inverted T waves in the right pericardial leads with a little bit more with tall R and V2. This is a case of pulmonary embolism. The ECG of pulmonary embolism will show sinus tachycardia as in this case, which is a very important sign. Right axis deviation, right bundle branch block, sometimes will be found, B pulmonal, right ventricular strain like an RVH, and S1, Q3, T3 pattern. S1 means deep S wave in lead 1. Q3 means Q wave in lead 3. T3 means inverted T wave in lead 3. Another case. This is very clear alternation in the voltage of the QRS compressor from beat to beat. And then in the chest leads, we can find even the electrical axis is different. Here it is negative and positive, negative then positive. Here is the so-called electrical alternance, which is very unique in cases of cardiac tamponade. Electrical alternance. Cardiac tamponade, as in cases of pericardial effusion, ECG will be low voltage, small normal complex, less than five small squares in voltage and limb leads, and less than 10 small squares in chest leads. To name the ECG as low voltage, should be less than five small squares or one big square in the leads and less than two big squares in the chest leads. Electrical alternance, alternating low and high voltage of the QRS complex. Here is another case. We can find here a very high heart rate and a wide QRS complex. And there is a little bit slurring of the QRS upstroke. From the irregular rhythm that can see here, we can say this patient has either atrial fibrillation because the rhythm is irregular. So this patient has either atrial fibrillation or multifocal atrial tachycardia. The differentiating point is the presence of the B waves, especially in lead two, and here there is no B waves. So this patient has atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response. Okay, but what about the white QRS complex? The white QRS complex in atrial fibrillation can be due to either bundle branch block or another code like accessory pathway causing widening of the QRS complex in case of WBW syndrome. So what is the differentiating point? If we look here to this RR interval, they are very close to each other to the degree that only one big box is the interval between these two successive Rs. So the heart rate between these two successive R's is about 300 because 300 divided by the big squares between two successive R's if we will calculate the heart rate between these two successive R's only it will be 300 divided by 1 so the heart rate here is about 300 this is not logic for the AV node to pass this very high heart rate because there is a physiological delay that we explained before the AV node couldn't pass this very high heart rate and couldn't 
let this complex come very near to the previous complex like that. So this is rapid atrial fibrillation with a very high heart rate, it's about 290 in some cycles that can make you diagnose or to suspect the presence of accessory pathway. WBW syndrome. This is the SA node, AV node, the normal conducting system, but here is the accessory pathway leading to bypassing the normal conducting system that will allow passing of the atrial stimulation to the ventricles without the normal physiological delay happening in the AV junction. Again, the ECG criteria to diagnose WBW syndrome will be short BR interval, delta Y, wide QRS complex. But in cases of atrial fibrillation, we will not find this BR interval because literally the B wave is absent. So we can find the delta wave and the wide QRS complex. But in very high heart rate, this will not be clear. That's why we can suspect WBW syndrome in cases of severe tachycardia with heart rate of about 290 or 300 beats without the presence of these classical features. As we said, because the AV junction cannot respond to this very high heart rate. Usually there is a physiological delay or physiological block in the AV junction. So in these cases, there is a high probability of the presence of accessory pathway that conducts this very high heart rate to the ventricles by passing the physiological block presence in the AV node. Here again, short BR interval, the delta wave, the wide QRS complex, WBW syndrome.